Oh, greetings everyone. Just reading a Doctor Who graphic novel I picked up recently. This one's pretty cool actually. It features all ten of, well, the first ten Doctors. The eleventh Doctor hadn't come along yet. But uh, yes, hello and welcome. Yes, I'm sorry for the delay. It's taken far too long to get around to, to getting this party started. It is, of course, the 50th anniversary of Doctor Who this year. Uh, the longest running sci-fi franchise in history, period. It actually beats Star Trek by one year, and that's taking into account the, uh, the, the creation of the original pilot of Star Trek. So, yeah, take that, Star Trek. Doctor Who beats you. Ha! <laughs> uh, but seriously, folks, um, I've been a Whovian for a very long time. I've been watching the show since I was about nine years old. And um, I just love it. I think it's one of the greatest sci-fi, fantasy, adventure shows ever created. And uh, I couldn't be happier about the 50th anniversary this year. There's so much going on. I mean, there's, there's a big 50th anniversary special in the works featuring the, the 10th and 11th Doctors. There's a big audio adventure featuring the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th Doctors. Uh, coming from Big Finish, there's a series of comic books from IDW. There's uh, a TV movie. A uh, dramatized account of the original creation of the series back in the 60s. And there's just so much going on. Plus, not the least of which being the DVD line. The DVD collection of the original 26 season classic series will finally be complete as of the end of this year. And uh, that's one thing I wanted to talk about today a little bit. But, um, oh, oh dear. Well, that shouldn't have happened. That's that's not good at all. Um, let me see if I can find out what's going on here. Uh, does this thing work again? Ah. Uh huh. Never quite sure how to read this thing. Ah, there we go. Apparently, they're uh, slightly out of phase with with our timeline here. Let's see if we can bring them back into phase again. Um, you might want to stand back a little bit. This this could be could, could be a little bit major. I've never really attempted something like this before. I mean, it is just a screwdriver after all. But let's see what we can do. Oh, here they come. Okay, stand back. Stand back. I think that's much better. Not quite sure what happened there, but gotta love the trusty Sonic. Well, speaking of which, I think I have one more use for it. Let's get this party started, shall we? Welcome back. And BBC, please don't sue me. It's just a bit of fun, a fan expressing his love. Well, I thought for this sort of introductory video to the world of uh, my personal journey into Whoviandom, um, I'd give you a little bit of personal retrospective, sort of what, uh, you know, how I got into the show, how I first heard about it, and that sort of thing. So going back a little bit to about 1980, I would have been about eight years old, the first I had ever heard of Doctor Who in any way, shape, or form was this book here, a book about robots. 
Yeah, first published uh, by Penguin Books in 1978. In fact, I think this might be the only time it was published. But anyway, really cool book, just all about robotics and robots in fiction throughout history up to that point. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about robotics in Japan and uh, industrial robots and robots from movies and TV shows. So I had never really watched any British television as a kid. I didn't really know anything about it. I was still kind of learning. So there's a lot of photos in this in this book throughout. I mean, a lot of stuff of you know old robot designs from throughout history and whatnot, and um, you know some strange art pieces like that and things like that. And what else we got? I think this was actually the first time I'd ever heard of Metropolis as well. So that was that was the first I'd seen of Metropolis. Very cool. In addition to the black and white photos, um, as a lot of books of this type tended to have back then, is uh, they'd have sections of color photos as well. So there was one in particular that caught my eye as a as a kid and part of the Star Wars generation, and that was this one here. Good old R two D two and C three P O. But something else caught my eye. This big guy underneath them. I'd never seen a robot like that before. So I read the little caption and here's what it says. Robot from the long-running BBC television weekly serial Doctor Who. A science fiction program for children aged 11 to 14. It is also very popular with many adults and has been presented since 1963. And that little blurb right there, next to that picture right there, was the very first time I had ever even heard of this Doctor Who thing. I had no idea what it was. I kind of, you know, was trying to imagine just from that blurb, what could this show be about? So I was picturing some kind of, I don't know, mad scientist thing or something. Um, I had no idea. No clue whatsoever. So just a couple pages later, this, by the way, uh, for those who are wondering, this is the robot from the story entitled robot, which was actually Tom Baker, the fourth Doctor's uh, very first story. So just a couple pages later, we have another picture. Next to this rather gorgeous sci-fi lady, we got a picture of the Cybermen from 1968. Again, from Doctor Who. This one tells us even less. It just says Cybermen from the BBC television serial Doctor Who, 1968. So if that's 1968, that's probably a shot from The Invasion, which was quite a, an epic story from the Second Doctor's era. So, my curiosity was piqued. I really wanted to know more about this Doctor Who thing. I'd never seen it. It wasn't... I was living in Winnipeg at the time with my parents. It wasn't on any of the channels there, so I couldn't see it. Um, however, we would visit relatives back in Ontario fairly often. So one day, uh, you know, at least six months or so after getting the book and looking at it and trying to imagine what this Doctor Who thing was all about, uh, we went on a vacation to Ontario, spent about a week there, and uh, I was at my aunt's place, and I was just kind of, you know, bored and flipping through the TV guide, uh, is there anything good, maybe there's some cartoons or something, and then there it is, 5.30 p.m., Channel 17, uh, which is WNED, by the way, which Doctor Who fans may remember hearing mention of as as being a source for some of the recovered lost episodes over the years. Well, that was the first station I ever actually saw Doctor Who on. They're based out of Buffalo, New York. So, 5.30, Doctor Who. Like, oh my God, Doctor Who's on here. It didn't give me any indication as to what it was, still just Doctor Who, science fiction, Channel 17, 5.30. So I looked at the clock, it was like 10 to 6. So I'm like, oh my God, it's almost over! <laughs> So I quickly said, can, 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 I, can I switch over to uh, Channel 17? I've been really wanting to see what this Doctor Who thing is all about. And I was just freaking out. So I flip over to Channel 17 and had no idea what was going on. It was the tail end of an epic four-part story, uh, the big epic conclusion. And this was the first thing I ever saw. How long have we got, Doctor? At the speed at which the rocket is approaching, two or three minutes. The Vogan rocket? Yes. Oh. That's right. The 
getting away. Then the Sky Striker will simply destroy the empty beacon. If it is empty. Okay, so we have a couple of characters who are who are tied up on a space station, and there's just some crazy stuff going on. I had no idea what was going on, no idea who any of these characters were. I thought the girl had referred to the, the guy in the jacket with the scarf and the big hair as, as Doctor. So I was like, is that Doctor Who? Is that is that the guy, the character? And I had no idea, so I just kept watching. Oh, wait a minute. You're right, they're loosening. Good girl. That clock is getting too close for comfort. Hello, Voga. Hello, Voga. This is Nerva Beacon. Doctor, is that you? Commander, tell Vorus the Cybermen have abandoned the beacon. He's to aim the rocket at the cyber ship. But Dr. Boris is dead, and none of us here knows how to operate these controls. What? Just let me think. Oh my god. Did they just say Cybermen? Is, is this, are, are the Cybermen in this? Doctor, it's going to hit any second. Commander? Yes, Doctor. There are two levers on the left of the panel. Got them? Yes, I've got them. The top lever controls the angle of flight, and the lower one must be the direction and stabilizer control. Cogito ergo sum. Uh, what? I think, therefore, it missed. Yes, then we're still heading for the biggest bang in history. Oh, yes. Oh, no. They've blocked the gyro controls. The flight trimmers are jammed. What, what, what does that mean? It means we're heading for the biggest bang in history. The rocket is closing on the Cyberman's ship. Touch more starboard rudder, Commander. Come on, just a few more seconds. There's a missile on our front bow. Engage full thrust. Deploy energy It is the Cybermen, or at least it was. I saw them just long enough to see them get blown up. Oh well. But what else is going to happen? Is there any more Cybermen around? I really want to know more about these Cybermen things. I've only seen that one picture in the robots book. What's, what, what's the deal with the Cybermen? Why doesn't the Doctor put the beacon back on course? I thought he was taking evasive action, but look, he's coming straight towards us. Better give him a whistle, Commander. He does have these absent-minded moments. Yes, we are aware of it, Harry, very much so, and we're loaded with cyber bombs. What? Well, you better do something, old girl, and quickly. The doctor's doing his best, but the Cybermen have locked the gyro controls. It's still coming straight towards us. It's going to hit. It's going to hit. And if you want to find out what happens next, you'll just have to pick up the DVD. If you want to know which DVD it is, it's this one right here. That was the tail end of part four of Revenge of the Cybermen, which is actually the final story from Tom Baker's very first season. So my little nine-year-old brain was blown like i i mean yeah i mean i was coming out of being one of the first of the star wars generation so yeah i i understood that the effects weren't as good and stuff but i just attributed that to being it's a tv show i mean this is back in the day when tv and movies were there was a very clear line between them as far as special effects went this was this was before star trek the next generation and before a lot of the you know later 80s stuff that brought higher quality special effects to television so I didn't think anything of it. All I knew was I had come in and seen like just this incredible, tense, action-packed, exciting scene from what is honestly kind of a lackluster story. It's actually, I think that big epic conclusion is the best part of it. But wow, what an amazing introduction 
to Doctor Who. So for all these months, I had been wondering, what's the deal with the Cybermen and the robot and stuff? And what's, what's it all about? So having come in and seen the Cybermen in the very first scene I'd ever seen of Doctor Who, I, <coughs> I just naturally assumed it was a show about this doctor guy versus robots all the time. It wasn't until the following week, I guess, because uh, they were showing an episode a week, and we were spending a couple of weeks in, uh, in Ontario at the time. I was at my grandmother's place, and this time I was determined to see it from the beginning. So I asked, can, can I watch Doctor Who? And they said, sure, I have no idea what that is. And it's like, oh, it's, it's like a science fiction, it's a British show, and blah, blah, blah. So we put on Doctor Who, and it's part one of Terror of the Zygons, which I can't show you any clips from because it's not out on DVD yet. It's actually coming out on DVD later this year. Um, it's actually the final story from Tom Baker's era to come out on DVD. Really looking forward to it because that one and Revenge of the Cybermen are two very special ones for me. So I was watching the first part of Terror of the Zygons, which is a very scary story, especially if you're, if you're nine years old. It's about these shape-shifting aliens and uh, one of them disguises, uh, attacks one of the Doctor's companions, just comes out of nowhere. And like the cliffhanger ending of that episode is, is your first full look at a Zygon, and it's just like... <laughs> it's just coming at the, the companion, and then the theme music comes on, and I'm like, oh my god, that was terrifying. So at that point I realized that, okay, it's not just robots, it's other things too which just made it even more interesting to me. It's like, oh my God, this is like the coolest thing I've ever seen. I've no, I still have no idea what's going on and who most of these characters are, but I'm just, my, my little nine-year-old mind is just blown. Like, I need to see more of this show. So, back to Winnipeg and being Dr. Hulis for a while, but I, I have a distinct memory of playing in the front yard of, uh, of our townhouse there and uh, just kind of digging in the dirt, idly thinking about Doctor Who. And what I was, th I remember specifically what I was thinking was just think, right now, somewhere in Britain, they're making more episodes of Doctor Who. <laughs> just a random thought from my childhood. I guess it wasn't 19, I guess it was 1981 when all this was going on. So, I mean, it's, it's hard to... The years kind of blend together when you're remembering childhood memories. But anyway, 1981, 8081, thereabouts. Um, so, 1982, we actually moved back to Ontario. We used to live in Ontario. Then we moved to Winnipeg for a bit. Uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And then we moved back to Ontario. Um, and I was overjoyed, because, of course, the first thought that occurred to me was, we're moving to Ontario? I can watch Doctor Who all the time! <laughs> Yes, I was I was fast obsessed with the show because I mean it was it was literally unlike anything I had ever seen before and I I was used to standard sci-fi stuff you know grand sweeping space adventures Star Wars type stuff Star Trek um, you know a lot of cartoons and whatnot that I used to watch at the time like Black Star and uh, you know uh, Battle of the Planets and things like that but. Um, this was completely different, so I really wanted to check out more of it. And, of course, the fact that every episode ends on a cliffhanger just means that it makes you want to tune in again more because you want to find out what happens next. And, uh, yeah, it got its hooks into me pretty early. So the first complete story I ever saw, where I actually saw it all the way through from beginning to end, was, funny enough, just completely by coincidence, the story that immediately followed Terror of the Zygons, and that was this one, Planet of Evil. And uh, going forward from this, I was hooked. That was it. I was done. I was there for life, man. Move in for life. So going forward from Planet of Evil, I essentially got caught up on Tom Baker's entire run. And it went all the way through to his final story, Legopolis, where the end of it, he turned into somebody else. I was like... What? What What just happened? Like, this is the biggest cliffhanger ever. He just turned into a completely different guy. So I had no idea that Tom Baker was the fourth Doctor. I just assumed he was the only Doctor. I didn't know that there was... You know, and I, I probably thought at some point, wow, this guy's been doing it since 1963? That's crazy. <laughs> but, um... So it went to... So it went to his final episode, and then it cycled back to the beginning to Robot 
So I finally got to see Robot and see where the robot was from. So that was a big deal. It's like, oh my god, it's the robot! And it's the story's just called Robot. Who knew? How cool is that? And uh, but but I had no idea that there had been three previous Doctors, or that there was you know that this was a thing that was a part of the show that occasionally the lead actor would change. I mean, that just you know. That, like I said, completely unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It just didn't occur to me. So I just naturally thought, like, oh, I guess the next story will feature this other guy as the Doctor for a bit, and then Tom Baker will come back, right? That That's how it's going to work, isn't it? No. No, sorry. So around this time, they were gearing up for the 20th anniversary of the show. So I was getting caught up on some of the earlier Tom Baker stories that I had missed and whatnot. And um, I read a news article in, uh, so this would have been 1983. So over the course of, of 82 to 83, I was, you know, getting caught up on the Tom Baker episodes. So shortly after it cycled back to the beginning, there was a newspaper article about the 20th anniversary of the show coming up and the big plans for that. And they were talking about a special that they were going to do called The Five Doctors, which is this one right here now this so this is the uh, special 20th anniversary um event movie like tv movie that they did that featured all five of the previous doctors and a whole bunch of the uh, monsters and villains from the 20 year history of the show now this little newspaper article i i wish i had it somewhere i swear that i do have it somewhere but i uh have no idea where it is probably buried in a box somewhere but anyway um so this newspaper article was really enlightening to me because it featured a picture. I'll see if I can find it. Is this the picture here? Maybe this is the picture. If not, if there's nothing there, then I couldn't find the picture. If I could, then this is the picture that accompanied the article. So anyway, so I saw this picture, and I'm looking at it, and thinking, well, who are all these other guys? I recognize him, that's Tom Baker. And I recognize him as the, the guy that he turned into. But who are these other three guys? I'd never seen them before. I had no idea that there had been three previous Doctors. So, again, mind blown. So I'm like, so now I'm thinking, well, how much more Doctor Who is there that I haven't seen yet? <laughs> so, finally, the local PBS stations uh, did pick up some of the earlier episodes. They went back, they picked up the John Pertwee episode, so I was able to see the rest of the 70s era of Doctor Who, and I thought he was fantastic. I really liked his stuff a lot, because it was very close in tone and feel to the Tom Baker stories, you know, very similar. You know, a lot of the same production crew were on them and stuff like that. So, um, so the two complemented each other very nicely, and that's always been my favorite era of Doctor Who, because I think there's just a really nice consistency to it. Plus, it's just uh, some of the greatest stories and, uh, and characters came out of that era as well. Just really, really terrific stuff. Um, so then, there was actually two PBS stations that were showing it at the time. There was uh, WNED Channel 17, which was showing it five days a week, Monday through Friday, uh, one episode a day. And then on weekends, they would show a movie or an omnibus compilation of a complete story. So they would have all the, sto you know, four parts or six parts or whatever, edited together into a movie-style presentation, just cutting out the titles between episodes, and you could watch it all in one massive go. Um, so for a while, they, they kind of just had, the, you know, they'd have the daily episodes and they'd have a different story on the weekend. But then they picked up the Fifth Doctor stories, so they would show the Fifth Doctor stories on the weekend as a movie, and then show the older episodes during the week as individual episodes. And then uh, the other PBS station just showed one half-hour episode per week. They were really stingy. But uh, at least it meant I could get caught up on a lot of stuff fairly quickly just by having a lot of uh, you know a lot of episodes coming out all the time um, then eventually when the the weekend movies got caught up to the current uh, more or less to the current series now this this was a time also I mean nowadays with Doctor Who we get the episodes pretty much at the same time all over the world you know UK US it's all the same we get them all on the same day or within a day of each other because like it's not a big delay back then we would literally have to wait six months to a year so we would actually be almost a full season behind the UK so it was agony waiting for the new seasons to come out because of course I would collect the Doctor Who magazines and read about the new seasons all the time but I wouldn't get to see them until almost a year later sometimes you know eventually the gap narrowed and now you know they figured it out and they they get them all out at the same time but 
back then it was a very different uh, different world um, oh one other thing I wanted to mention just to backtrack a little bit was uh, you remember how the the the, the art the blurb in the robot uh, book said that the uh, show was aimed at 11 to 14 year olds and I was quite proud of the fact that I first saw it when I was 10 <laughs> I felt like haha I'm seeing a show that's intended for older kids I'm so bad you know like I'm doing this big taboo thing watching Doctor Who when I'm 10 yeah meanwhile now I'm watching it with my six-year-old and she's loving it so go figure yeah I don't know where they got that aimed at 11 to 14 year olds thing from looking back on it now it just seems very arbitrary to me I mean it's always been considered a family show you know there's stuff for the grown-ups stuff for the kids they can everybody can watch it and enjoy it together but, um, yeah, so anyway, so the whole concept of there being five doctors was, was very mind-blowing to me. So, finally, after getting caught up with the, um, uh, at the time, the Peter Davison stories, uh, the fifth doctor, uh, WNED picked up the first two doctors' stories. So, finally, like, I don't know, three or four years after initially getting into the show, they were showing the really old episodes. I guess it, it was probably around 1980... Actually, no. More like five years, I guess. It was around 1986? 85, 86, I guess? Yeah, so I guess about three or four years. Anyway, so around 85, 86, they picked up the William Hart and Ellen Patrick Troughton stories. So finally, I was able to see the very first story. And I, I distinctly remember the first time I saw an unearthly child. Now, my dad was never particularly into the show. He didn't really care much about it, but he appreciated the fact that it was really long-running and that it had a huge fan base and stuff like that. You know, I mean, you'd see all the merchandise I would buy, and, and uh, I was collecting the comics at the time. Marvel, Marvel Comics in the U.S. was actually reprinting the uh, Doctor Who magazine comic strips in color as just comic book issues every month and I collected I used to have a complete set of those but they sadly went missing when I lost a box of books and comics you know move many moons ago lost a lot of good stuff in that box yeah one of my goals is actually to reacquire the original run of those I do have some of them but um, I don't have the complete set anymore but anyway getting sidetracked as I always do uh, so I remember very distinctly watching an unearthly child for the very first time and uh, my dad was in the basement, this is where the TV was, um, my dad was in the basement at the time just puttering around doing something, and when the, the, the beginning of the very first episode came on, he actually stopped what he was doing and watched the first, like, five, ten minutes or so. And, uh, because he knew that, for me especially, that was a very big deal. I mean, I, I think most Doctor Who fans will agree, I mean, love or hate the old episodes, when you sit down and watch the very, very first episode for the very first time, you really get the sense that you're watching history in the making. You know, it just, there's some, just, <laughs> you have this feeling of a sense of awe the first time you see that. And, you know, if you've ever seen the first episode, it's basically the, the familiar theme comes on, the titles come on, but the theme continues running. It's like the full-length version of the theme throughout the first scene. And then it slowly fades down when we see the TARDIS for the first time, just this police box in a junkyard, and the music fades down, and you just hear the hum of the TARDIS. And it's a great, iconic moment in television history right there. I mean, because that really is history being made. That's ground zero right there. Episode one, scene one, you know, and that's where it all began. So... Over the years, I collected a lot of Doctor Who merchandise, again, some of which I no longer have, a lot of which was in the aforementioned box that went missing. Um, I used to have a good chunk of the Target novelizations of the episodes. A lot of my first experiences with early stories of the series were through reading the novelizations. Um, I had the complete run of the Marvel comics. Um, I had a bunch of stuff. Luckily, most of my Doctor Who stuff was in other boxes, so the only Doctor Who stuff I lost out of that box was the comics and the novels. But um, I've since managed to reacquire a few of them, but um, I've been focusing on other areas of the collection. This year, being the 50th anniversary, seemed like a good time to rebuild the DVD collection. I'm now happy to say I have more Doctor Who DVDs than I have ever had in my entire life. Behind me, I have every single current release of the first second and third doctors um there's a few couple uh, additional third doctor stories that i don't presently have uh they're actually but i have ordered them they're on their way in the mail 
Um, there's only one story left to be released, actually, and then all stories will be available in one form or another uh, for the third Doctor, that is, and that's The Mind of Evil, which is coming out next month. So I will definitely be grabbing that as soon as it goes out for pre-order on, uh, you know, through one of my regular eBay dealers. But uh, quite an impressive collection. We're going to be talking about the DVDs quite a bit over the next few months. Um, I'm going to do a DVD disambiguation. So for those of you wondering about what order the uh, the old, uh, you know, all the all these multitudes of volumes actually go in, um, I'm going to clear that up for you. Uh, I'm also going to sit down and do individual reviews of each DVD and give you my thoughts on each individual story and stuff like that. So, yeah, probably won't get through all of those by the anniversary date, but we'll we'll try to get through a good chunk of them anyway. Ah, <sighs> so essentially, in a nutshell, that's how I became a Whovian. I owe it all to this obscure book about robots. I'm sure I would have discovered the show anyway through other means at some point, but. This is it. This is where it began. Robots from Penguin Books, 1978. Great little book, i got to say. I've always enjoyed that one. And I kept it in pretty good shape, too, all things considered. Kind of surprised about that. Alrighty, so that is it. By the way, I know this said Journey of a Whovian Part 1. Uh, th these, the rest of them aren't going to be numbered like that. I just did that as a bit of fun, just so it would look and feel like a Doctor Who episode. Hope you enjoyed that. Anyway... Ah, I think it is time for me to dematerialize. So until next time, thanks for watching, and sayonara. Wrong button. There we go.